Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Praise God. It's Mother's Day. Thank you for being here. Thank you for our moms and our wives. And as Pastor Jeff said, we wouldn't be here without them. So uh, thank you for that great wisdom this morning, brother. Uh, Sometimes we do things that just don't make sense. Uh, Yesterday, I signed up and I competed in a half Ironman triathlon. Uh, For (laughs) Danny said, what's wrong with you? (laughs) Uh, For those who don't know what that is, that's uh, 1.2 miles of swimming, followed by 56 miles of biking, and then a half marathon or 13.1 miles of running. Like I said, sometimes we do things that don't make sense. Uh, But things went well yesterday. At least they started well. Um, Got into the water. It was down at White Lake. Got into the water, and it was great. It was uh, cool, but but not cold. And I had a wetsuit on, and uh, that is great to be out there in the water in. And made my time in 47 minutes and ran up into T1 and began to transition, got out my wetsuit, got my bike gear on, and headed out for 56 miles, and everything was going good. I was, I was on track to beat my record, uh, in and out of swim and transition in, in, in one hour. Got on the bike and began looping uh, this area for 56 miles. It was a two-loop uh, track around White Lake and the area. And uh, You know, it's amazing to me how many hills there are in White Lake. I mean, it's not, it's not rolling, but it's this constant, steady incline uh, actually, 1,006 feet of elevation yesterday, and, and uh, you know this cool weather we have today? Well, it got blown in during my race yesterday, and so we had like a headwind all day for three hours. But when I was coming in to, to T2, I was right on track, three hours on the bike, just over with a few seconds over, I was right on track to finish and beat my record in and out of T2 in three minutes, got my bike rack, got my change of gear from my bike outfit into my running gear, and out I went on this 13-mile run. And, you know, really things were going well at the beginning of the run. I was on track. I was on pace and went out and back. And when I turned at 6.5 miles, the midpoint of the race, I was on schedule. I had done it in one hour. That's a little slow, but for some of you, I'm sure. But you run four hours of this other mess and then go run a marathon, right? You know, so I was on track and I was doing great. But then when I made that second loop to go back out, that's when the wheels fell off. And that's when I began to run and what took me an hour and then took me an hour and a half. It was taking me 50% longer to do the second half of the race than the first. And I'll be honest, there were times in the second half of the race, the second half of the run where uh, my, my feet hurt, and my knees hurt, and it was hot, and my legs were burning, and I was thinking, you know, I'm ready to quit. You know, in the Christian life sometimes like that? Yeah. We get out in the middle of the race, and we get out in the middle of whatever it is that life's called us to do, and sometimes we get to a point where we go, you know, this stinks. I'm ready to quit. Well, that's the message in Hebrews chapter 12. Take your Bible and join me there this morning. Hebrews chapter 12, the the writer of Hebrews uses a image of a long distance race and the endurance that it takes to do that, to challenge his listeners to not turn back to Judaism, not to quit and go home and You see, they were in a very similar situation. They could look at the past and go, man, if I just turn around and go back, I'll be done. It'll be easier. As they looked forward, they looked forward into persecution. They looked forward into suffering. They looked forward into the days of Nero, who was going to literally burn Christians at the stake. They could look in the future, if you will, and see the horizon. And they were beginning to question whether it was better to quit and go home. Likewise, many of us have contemplated that same issue. I'm not a prophet or son of a prophet. I do work for a nonprofit, so there you go. (laughs) But I'm telling you that the days of easy Christianity are in our past. You look at where the choices that our government's making, you look at the choices that the courts are making, the laws are making, you look at what it's going to be like to do what we do in 20 years, when my kids are older even than they are now, 
We're facing a day where we're going to have to contemplate, is it easier to just go back and quit? Or is it worth it to persevere into the future? Because honestly, there are days when it's better to stop. If you've ever been on a run, you go out for an easy run, you go start sprinting, and all of a sudden you get that cramp in your side, and you think, well, I know how to fix the cramp in my side. You just stop running. And when you stop, the cramp goes away. But how many of you know in a race, uh, at the end of the race, if you look at the results column, if you don't finish the race, what they put in the results column is three letters, D-N-F, did not finish. And what I think that none of us in this room want is none of us want a DNF when we get to heaven. We want to get to heaven and and the Father look at us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You finished the race. Come in and get your reward. And so let's look at that this morning. I want to challenge you this morning to run the race with endurance, keeping your eyes on Jesus. And and what I want to remind you this morning is this this four-word phrase, keep running don't stop. Take your Bible. If you're physically able, would you open it up and stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. And I want to ask this question. How do we run and not stop? And I believe the writer here gives us four very simple actions. Listen to what he says, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Would you join me in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, help us understand what it means to run the race with endurance. God, I imagine in this room there are folks who are struggling in various areas of their life and choices and decisions. And God, I pray that this message would be an encouragement to them to keep running and not stop. Teach us, we pray, through your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 You guys be seated this morning. So how do you run? How do you run a race and not stop? How do you keep on running this long distance, enduring triathlon or marathon or whatever it might be? Well, I think the writer of Hebrews comes to us and he gives us four actions, four choices, four things that we can do that I think if we'll put them into our life, they will really encourage us and they will really help us. Action number one is this. Find encouragement in those who have gone before you. Find encouragement in those who have gone before you. Look at what he says in verse 1. He says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. He, He goes back with the word therefore, and he goes back to chapter 11, and he begins to pull everything that he's just unloaded in the 40 verses of last week and says, listen, therefore, we have such a large cloud of witnesses and the question is often begged, are these, are these, is, are these people in chapter 11, are they, are they spectators or are they encouragers? And I think the answer is very simple. I don't think they're spectators. I don't think they're sitting in the arena watching us. It's not about them watching us. It's about us understanding who they are. It's about us understanding what they've done. In fact, if you go back to chapter 11 and just kind of go through it, we see some encouragement and the men and women that are listed in chapter 11. Uh, Jeff alluded to some of this last week, but just go back and let me mention some of the names. Verse 4, by faith Abel. Verse 5, by faith Enoch. By faith Noah. By faith Abraham. Uh, verse 11, by faith even Sarah herself. And then it says in, in verse 17, by faith Abraham. Verse 20, by faith Isaac, by faith Moses, by faith uh, Rahab. All these people are mentioned. These are, these are men and women of God who were earthly winners. They won here on earth. Why do you say that? Well, because we know their names. We know their stories. It has been preserved for us in the Word of God that we can remember that they did something incredible. They endured, 
and they're no different than we are. Can I just remind you, even though we live in a world of superhero fantasy, these are just everyday men and women. They, they were not superheroes with superpowers. They're much the same as you and me. They just, by faith, trusted God in the difficulties of their days, in the persecution of their day, in the suffering of their day. They just simply lived by faith. And then when you get down to verse 32, notice that he changes a little bit. He says, and what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon and Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength and weakness, became mighty in battle, put foreign armies to fight, women received their dead, raised alive. These are men and women who did incredible things. And here's what's cool. They saw the reality of their faith lived out. In other words, they got their award here. God delivered them and God provided for them. But there's also some people in chapter 11 who didn't receive an earthly award, but they will receive and did receive a heavenly reward. Look at, look at verse 36 to the end of the chapter. Notice what happens in verse 36. He changes and he goes, others. Others. People that we don't even know their names. Why? Because they get no accolades here. Others experienced mockings and scourgings as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. Don't sign me up for that one. Can I get an amen? Uh, they died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith. But they didn't receive what was promised. They got no accolades here. They got no trophy. They got no medal. Since God had provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. In other words, these are the men and women who lived faithfully to encourage us so that we could look at their life and go, man, they went through it. They suffered and they endured. Maybe I can do this too. Yesterday, in the middle of the run, there was this couple so the run was uh, 13 miles. It was three and a quarter miles out, then back, then back, and then back. About 1.5 miles out, there, was this, there were people all over the place, but there was this one couple that were kind of entertaining, if you will. They had pulled their SUV on the side of the road, and they opened the hatchback, and they cranked up their music. So when you got close to them, you could hear the music. Now, you have to understand, in a triathlon, you're not allowed to wear headphones and have music. It's a safety issue. They want you to be aware of what's going on around you. So many things happening, and they want you to be able to hear the judges and the officials. And so you can't have music. So when you get somewhere that's got music, you're like, hey. I can do this, right? Well, this particular couple was kind of neat. There was this guy who's still on the side of the road, and everybody ran by. He's like, hey, guys, good job, good job. And then his wife, I assume it was his wife, sat on this little white cooler, and she clapped and cheered us all day long. I remember coming back the second time, and she was like, you're almost there. I thought, you have no idea. I have a whole other lap to do. <laughs> but they were there every time. It was a 1.5, then back, and it's like, hey, and we go back and back and forth. But you know what? I thought about it. They, they were great cheerers, but they were not all that great encouragers. You say, well, why is that? They weren't in the race. They were just sitting there. They may have never run a race in their life. They were there to go, you can do this. I have no idea if I can, but you can do this, right? And what, what it made me think about was another time in my life when Paul Saunders, Paul the sax player, and I were on one of our many escapades of running We'd gone to Raleigh to run in a race, and, uh, and Paul was my early uh, running buddy. He was my, my, my pace setter. He was my companion. Uh, I was not a runner at the time, and Paul, you know, he got paid to run. He's in the Army, so he, he had a lot more running than I did. And we would go to these races, and Paul would, Paul would just run with me to kind of keep me on track. Well, this particular year, I was good. I was, I was keeping my pace. It was not a big deal. And, and Paul got about halfway through, and he said, hey, I'm feeling really good. Do you mind if I like sprint ahead to see how fast I can actually finish? Basically, he said, I'm going to leave you behind. But this is okay. This is fine. I said, that's fine, brother. Go ahead. I'll see you at the finish line. No lie. Man like, said like this, shoom, and just left me in his dust. 
So he finishes the race, and I'm running. And next thing I know, I'm about a mile and a half from the finish line. And what do I see? But Paul Saunders has finished the race, turned around, and run back to me. And when he saw me, he got in with me and began to run with me. He said, man, you can do this. It's just a little bit further. This is the last heel. This is the last turn. The finish line is just around the corner. You got this. And that's the kind of encouragement I need. Somebody who's in the race, who's finished the race, to say, you can do this. You know what we need? We need to be reminded that there have been men and women who have finished the same race that we're in, who say, you got this. You can do this. And what I want to encourage you to do this morning is take time to remind yourself about the great men and women of the faith. Take time to go back to Hebrews 11 and, and find one of those stories that resonates with you and go, Man, let me go back into the Old Testament and dig up their story. Let me read about what they really went through and how hard it was for them. Maybe that will encourage me today because I know other people have done it. Let me encourage you to read biographies of Christian missionaries and Christian evangelists who have, who have lived in our culture, in our society, and are still incredibly faithful because of what they've done. Go back and read the stories of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot who gave their life on the mission field. Read the stories of people like William Carey who left it all to go to the cross, I mean, to, to go to the mission field. Read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read the story of Amy Carmichael. Go find the stories of men and women. And be encouraged that there are people who are living today who are just like us, who are finishing the race. In fact, I, I want to encourage you with a book. Uh, a lot of times we tell you to do stuff and you're like, I don't know how to do that. Here's a really good book. It's called 10 Who Changed the World. It's written by Danny Aiken, the president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. If you're not big on reading, he's got one called Five Who Changed the World. If you can only, if you can only handle five, go get that book. But these are stories about biographies of men and women, people like Eric Liddell, who chariots of fires after, who, who because of his faithfulness to Christ did not run in the Olympic Games on Sunday. And go read his story about what his real story was like and how he was faithful every day. Be encouraged. Find encouragement in those who have gone before us. It will help you run your race. But secondly, we also need to remove anything that hinders our race. When the writer of Hebrews continues, he goes on like this. He says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witness surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. That word lay aside is, is used about eight times in your New Testament. And every time it's used, it has the idea of, of putting away or taking all for ridding yourself, usually of some kind of clothing. You see, in the first century, when runners ran, they would come into the stadium, into the arena, in these long, flowing, colorful gowns. Kind of put in your mind Rocky Balboa coming into the, the boxing ring. He's got on his yellow satin Italian stallion outfit, and then he takes it off, and he's got just his boxing shorts on. I mean, he's got all this colorful. He wouldn't dare fight in that. But he takes it off, he's how he comes in. And the, the runners in that day would come into the arena with all this garb on. And at the appropriate time, they would lay it aside so they would run virtually naked. Now, let me just help you out a little bit. I did not run naked yesterday. Can I get amen for that? But I do run as light and as thin as I can. Now, now when I go out to train for a run, I have a running belt, my Gatorade, and my Band-Aids, and my goo, and my phone. And, but listen, it was race day. I didn't want anything extra on me. So I didn't run with that. I didn't run with my phone. I, I dress as lightly as I could. When I'm on my bicycle and I'm cycling down the road, I have this lycra skin tight. It's a bad image. I understand that. But I got this skin tight stuff because I don't want anything to get dragged in the wind. Even when I'm swimming, I don't wear normal swimming trunks because they drag it away. I have these fancy skin tight jammers, they call them. And why? Because I don't want anything to hinder me from doing what I want. I want to be as light and as fast as I can. Well, that's what the writer says. Lay aside. Remove anything that's going to hinder you. And then he gives us two things that we should remove. Notice what he says. He says in verse 1, he says, let us lay aside every hindrance. The word hindrance is only used one time in all of your New Testament, but it's used in Greek literature outside of the Bible. It's used has this idea of weight or bulk. It's the idea that you should remove anything that's excessively heavy. 
I have up here, these are my son Mark's uh, ankle weights. Any of you have ever used these? These are three, I don't, I'm not sure if they're three or five, I think these are five pound ankle weights. These are great for running in training. But nobody in their right mind runs a race with these, right? I, I had these when I was a kid. I used to wear them, and I'd go run, and, man, I'd build up my legs. And then when it was race day, man, I was fast because I'd take them off. But, you know, is there anything wrong with this? Is there anything illegal with this? No. But, but you wouldn't run a race with it. Why? Because it's one more thing that holds you down. The word there, lay aside every hindrance, refers to things that are in our life that are not wrong sinfully. He's going to come to that. But are things that are good, but not best. I want you to think about it this morning. Do you have any friendships that are holding you back from running the Christian race the way God would have you run it? Are there any places you go on a regular basis that maybe hinder you from being what God's called you to be? Are there hobbies? Are there things that you do that, that are just, they're not illegal. They're not sinful. They're just weighing you down. What the writer says is, lay those aside. Lay those aside, the things that hinder you. But then he goes on to a, a second word. He says, lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. The word sin there, of course, we understand that from a theological idea, but notice the phrase there, easily entangles you. It's something that trips you up. It's something that causes you to fall, to, to be obstructed. And I thought about it from my race yesterday, and, I, and this is the best thing I can remember. This little thing right here essentially caused me to be disqualified yesterday. Now, I hadn't shown up on my race results, but technically, this disqualified me. It's even smaller than that because you open it up, and what it is are headphones. And I told you earlier, you're not allowed to wear headphones in a triathlon because it's a safety issue. Because, listen, three hours with me on a bike talking to myself, that's a long time. And so I was like, hey, get me some Rocky music, some 80s cardio, right? But I was driving down the road, I was biking down the road, and and all of a sudden, this motorcycle comes up beside me. So on, the, on a triathlon, the, the, the officials cycle, they get on bikes and they ride around, make sure you're obeying the laws, that you're doing the right thing. And this motorcycle came up beside me, and I thought, oh, they're leaving. And then, then they slowed down. And then she got up beside me, and here's what, here's what the lady on the back was doing. She was looking at the bike number on my bike and writing it down. Why? Because... These are illegal. And essentially, my choice to wear these disqualifies me. But they're so little. Not a big deal. I knew what I was doing. I, I chose to wear these. It was my decision. But you know what? They still disqualified me. And that's what sin is in our life. Sin is, I know this is wrong, but it's not going to bother anybody. It's little. It's not, it's not like I was, you know, doing steroids or something. It was, I was wearing headphones. But in the rule book, it's illegal. And what the writer of Hebrews says is, listen, you need to lay aside anything that hinders you, like friendships and whatever it is, they're not sinful. They're just, they're just holding you back. They're bearing you down. It's the burden. And you also need to lay aside the sin that you willingly choose to do. So what, about, what is it for you this morning? Are you, are you struggling with some kind of hindrance? Are you suffering from some sin that's, that's not a major sin in the world's eyes? It's not something that everybody notices and sees. It's, it's not tearing you apart. But you know it's in the rule book. And you did it anyway. Just like I knew the rule and did it anyway. The writer says, find encouragement in others. Remove anything that's going to hinder you. Number three, he says this, run with endurance. 
the race that lies before you. Look at what he says at the end of verse 1. He says, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. The word run is used 20 times in your New Testament. It has the idea of running, progressing, advancing, exerting oneself. And and it could mean any kind of run. It could be a sprint. It could be a little short 100-yard dash, you know, 100-meter dash. It could be the Usain Bolt of the world. But when you couple it with the idea of the word race, and the word race that's used here in Hebrews 12.1 is the Greek word agon, which is where we get our English word agony. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Sam's run a marathon. She knows what it's like. Some of you have run marathons. You know, marathons are, they're, they're in agony, right? Uh, four or five hours, depending on how fast you are, four or five hours of movement, constant movement. Listen, yesterday at six and a half hours, I can tell you everything about yesterday was agony to me, right? And what Paul, uh, excuse me, the writer of Hebrews says here is run with the, run the race, run this agonizing, heart-wrenching course. And how do you do that? Well, he says it right there, run with endurance. Run with perseverance. Run with steadfastness. Run, make it a decision every day to do what you've got to do. It's a race of choice. It's a race of step after step after step. And Brian Wilkerson tells a story about his own marathon race. He was running in the New York Marathon many years ago, and he said, man, when you first start the race, it's incredible. You're, it's a party atmosphere. There's everybody's downtown New York, and it's just all this excitement, all these people. He said, it's like that for about 13 miles until you cross over into Manhattan. Once you get into Manhattan, you're away from the crowds, and you're out there by yourself. He says, when you're out there by yourself, that you begin to, to hit the wall. You begin to physically and psychologically get to a point where you're like, I just want to die and quit. Uh, Brian tells a story that when he was there, he, he ran by about mile 16 or 18, he said it was. He said, I saw the medical tent. And in the medical tent were people pale and gaunt, and they were laying out on the, on the uh, little beds there, and they were hooked up with IVs. And he said, you sorry dogs, you lucky dogs. I mean, he was looking at these guys thinking, I'd rather be them than doing what I'm doing. Now, you got to be in a bad state of mind to think you'd rather be that person, right? But that's where he was because he was, he was done. He said, as I kept getting into the race later and later, The only thing I could begin to think about was just pick up one step after another. It's not six miles, five miles, four miles. It's one step, and then another step, and then another step. And if we're honest this morning, some of you are facing that. You're physically, psychologically, emotionally tired. You're done This Christian thing is not worth it. And what I would encourage you with when the writer of Hebrews says, run with endurance. Pick up your foot and take one more step. What we need to do in this world that we're living in is just take one more intentional step in the right direction. Yesterday in the middle of that race, as I was getting into the run part, and I was beginning to hit the wall. I was beginning to think, man, I'm done. I just want to quit and go home. It literally got to the point where I slowed down. And yeah, I had some times where I walked because I, like, I was like done, right? I was physically and mentally shot. But I kept moving. I never stopped. I never uh, did that. I prayed about it a few times, but I never did that. What did I do? I kept moving forward. What you need to do is keep moving forward. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, you know, I I know as a believer, I need to read my Bible, but man, I'm not, I I don't know where to start. Just start with one chapter a day. Start, start small. I I need to pray. I know I need to pray. Pastor's always talking about prayer. I can't pray for three hours. Neither can I. (laughs) Just pray once. Pray today. Tomorrow, decide you're going to pray tomorrow. You say, man, I, I want to be the Billy Graham of, of, of Fayetteville. I want to share Jesus with everybody I meet. Listen, just tell one person this week that Jesus loves them. Start small, but make intentional steps every day 
I didn't set out yesterday or on Friday and decide I'm going to run a marathon. I'm going to run a triathlon. I started years ago, and I built up to it little by little. If you'd asked me a few years ago, are you going to go run a marathon? I would have said, you're crazy. I can run about 20 minutes, and I'm gassed. And now I go out and run these four- and five-hour events, right? Why? Because I took intentional steps every day to build up the endurance to do it. And what my challenge is to us this morning is whatever it is, wherever you are, make intentional steps to run with endurance today. Don't worry about next week. Today. And then the last thing, and I know our time's up. you got to get home to Mother's Day dinner. Our last thing is this. After all that said and done, the last thing the writer says is you need to focus your attention on the perfect example. Look at what he says in verses 2 and 3. He says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and the perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. Two things that the writer says there. Number one, he says, look to Jesus. Do you see that in verse two? Keeping your eyes on Jesus. The idea there, the word there is really looking away to Jesus. It's the idea that you're looking at something else and you're getting distracted looking at the world, looking at the culture, looking at your pastor, looking at your church. And he says, don't look there, look to Jesus. That's where we need to keep our eyes. That's what we need to keep our focus on. Why? What he says in the text, he is the source. He is the author. He is the creator of faith. He is the one who we put our trust in. He is the one who has gone before us and laid it out. And then also he is the perfecter of faith. He is the only one who has done what we need to do. He is the one who came into our world as the person of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, which is the word that the writer chooses there. He doesn't say Christ or God or Holy One. He says, listen, remember that Jesus, who died on the cross for you, was a real man and in a real human body. He lived in our world. He was scorned and he was rejected and he was ugly. Uh, people were ugly against him and they cursed him and they eventually crucified him. That same Jesus who was faithful through it all is the source of faith, the perfecter of faith. He's the trailblazer. He's who we need to keep our eyes on. Be like him. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher of uh, London, England, tells a story of one day he comes and uh, the story of this uh, plowman who was going to have a, a contest to see who could make the, the straightest furrows in the field. And he got some judges together and three plowmen competed in this contest. And the first couple of guys, man, their, their plow lines were all kind of wiggly and squiggly and it was just ugly. And so he walks up to the first plowman, the judge does, and he says, sir, tell me, where, where were you looking? How are you plowing this field? And the guy said, well, I, I, I watched my hands on the handles. And I figured if I could see where my hands were the whole time, I could plow a straight field. And the judge said, well, that's great, but that's not what you did. Look at, look at how wavy your lines are. He goes to the second guy and he says, well, sir, uh, tell me about how you chose to plow your field. How did you make your furrow? He said, well, I, I watched the furrow. I, I looked down on the ground and, and tried to see where I was going, and that's where I went. And he said, yeah, but that didn't work for well for you either. Look at yours. You've got these large, swooping furrows. And he goes to the third guy who actually had these really nice straight lines. He said, sir, tell me, how did you pick your choice? How did you do yours? He said, well, you see, I looked between the ears of the horse and at the other end in the hedge on the other end of the field, there was a tree. And that's where I set my gaze is on that tree down there. And I thought if I could keep my eyes on that and keep the tree between the ears of the horse, I could plow a line. And that's what we need to do. We need to look down the line at Jesus, who's the author and the perfecter of our faith. We need to keep our eyes on him. And when we keep our eyes on him, we won't get distracted. We won't look around us. We won't get off course because we're looking in the right direction. Why? The writer says he is the author. He's the perfecter. He's the one who for the joy that was laid before him endured the cross. 
endured the crucifixion. He despised the shame for the joy of sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. He did it right. And we need to look at him. Don't look at me as your example. Don't look at our pastor as your example. Don't look at your neighbors as your example. Don't look to the social media as your example. Look to Jesus and focus your life and live for him. And everything else will come into play. Then he says in verse 3, consider Jesus. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Listen, you're, you and I are going to face hostility. It may not be the same when we get sawed in two and hit with a sword and fed to lions. It may be that. It may be worse. But consider Jesus. The word there, consider, has this idea of calculation, of mathematics, of saying what's on this scale and does it equal what this is on. And the Bible says, for consider him who endured such hostility so that you won't grow weary and you won't give up. I don't want us to give up, church. I don't want us to decide that at the end of the day, it's not worth it. Yesterday, at the end of the race, they were giving away prize money. I didn't get any. I think really what happened is they decided not to disqualify me because they said, that poor guy's time is so bad, this is just going to hurt him worse, so we're going to leave him alone. But yesterday, they were giving prize money away. You know, some people run these races to win money. I, you know what I got yesterday? I got a banana and a free T-shirt. That's what I got yesterday. Actually, that's not true. I got a trucker hat. Not sure what I'm going to do with it yet, but I got a trucker's hat and a medal. But, you know, we run races for all kinds of reasons. We run for the joy of dying. My wife says, you know you do this stuff to yourself, right? Like you, you go out and do this, and you come back and you're like, man, I'm sore. It's like it's your choice. Some people run to get the medal, the first place medal. Some people run to be cheered on. When I, when I think about Jesus, I, I'm reminded that in the first century when, when people ran these races, in the Olympic Games and the Isthmian Games, there was a pedestal at the end. And yes, they would put you up on you know, third place, second place, and first place. And, and then the person at first place would get this laurel crown, this wreath that they would put on their head and They'd walk around and wear it. But you know, I'm not sure that Jesus endured the cross for a piece of plant that he made in the first place. But you see, what happened was the winner of the race was called up to the emperor's box. And in the emperor's box, the winner, the victor, sat down at the right hand of the emperor. Why? Because they were victorious. When I think about Jesus, I think about the things that he endured. And I think, you know, it's not for a laurel wreath. It's not for man's praise. It's for the glory of God. Yeah. Jesus, in his own words, in John gospel said, I have finished what you've called me to do. John chapter 17, verse 4 and 5, I have glorified you on the earth. By completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. I think Jesus got it right. He got to the end and said, it's not about me. It's about what I do that gives you glory. And when we endure to the end, when we run and don't stop, we give Jesus and the Father all the praise. I've got one last piece of stuff up here. You know what this is? It's a white towel. Danny would use it for this, right? <laughs> but you know, in sports, a white towel signals what? Defeat. The year was 1980. Robert Duran or Duran, however you say his name, was fighting Sugar Ray Leonard. It was originally the brawl in Montreal, and Duran beat Sugar Ray Leonard. And so they had a match scheduled for a little later in that year. The battle, the, the brawl in Montreal was in the spring, and the second fight, the rematch, was in November. And in November at the Superdome in New Orleans, they fought again. 
The problem is, is that after Duran won the first fight, before the second fight, he kind of stopped training. And in his own words, he said, I got fat. Amen to that, right? That's kind of what I do after a triathlon too. And what happened was when he got to that fight in November, Sugar Ray Leonard pummeled him, beat the mess out of him. In the eighth round, Duran began to say, no moss, no moss, no moss, meaning no more. To which his cut man said, he quits. Match over. He's done. What I want to encourage you to do today is not to throw in the towel. Don't quit. You didn't sign up for a sprint. Jesus never promised it would be easy. All through Scripture, we see the reality that it's a long-distance endurance race. So find some people around you who will encourage you. Get involved in a small group. Get involved in a D group. Find some people you can do life with. Join a church where we can help you. But don't go at it alone. Then take audit of your own life. Say, what are the things that are in my life that are weighing me down? That are good, but they're not great. I wouldn't go in a race like this, but yet we often live out the Christian life, things that hold us back from what God's called us to be. And don't let something as small as two headphones disqualify you from the greatest reward that your Savior wants to give you. Yes, you might finish the race. Yes, you might get in. But do you really want to get in to be disqualified from the prize? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Why? Because he's much better than me. And he can do it. Just don't quit. Let's pray.